Hello, right, uh, we're going to talk about the axilla, also known as the armpit. On this uh, bony boy here, we can only see the bones, but we have muscles on top of the bones, and when you lay the muscles on here, you make a pyramidal space in here through which a number of structures pass. So yeah, sure, the armpit or the axilla, the armpit is covered in hairy skin, it makes some interesting smells, that sort of thing. But the axilla anatomy I'm really interested in is what is in here. What are the borders of the axilla? What runs through the axilla? and it's important because it narrows up here and we get something called thoracic outlet syndrome so what might get squashed and how might it get squashed and how might that manifest itself and that sort of thing all right the anatomy of the axilla all right this is tricky i got this this fella balanced here but that Shoulder region, upper limbs going off here, thorax, and then, I mean, I know you've got an axilla, but I wanted to show you, look, up here. So, we're forming uh, like a pyramid. It's got four sides to it. It's broad down here. We're actually missing one of the big muscles. We're missing pectoralis major, this guy here. But we have, like, pectoralis, we have big muscles here, big muscles here in the, and the scapula. We've got the... Um, body wall here, we've got the humerus here, so all of those things are forming this pyramid which actually you know changes shape as you move your upper limb at the shoulder and then things are going through the axilla, through this pyramid and at this end they're in the thorax and the neck and at this end they're supplying the upper limbs. So we're talking about nerves going to the upper limb, arteries going to the upper limb, veins coming from the upper limb, lymph nodes and that sort of thing. The other big thing that's in here is fat. So fat is the great space packer in the body, right? So there's fat in here filling this space and all of these structures are running through it. Fat's quite good as well because it moves quite nicely and gets squished and that sort of thing. But that is the axilla. Okay, so what are the walls of the axilla? The anterior border of the axilla is pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. So if you, I'm running out of hands, but if you, right, so you see where my thumb is there? My thumb there, that's the anterior border of the axilla. You've got a squidgy muscle there you can feel, right? That's what we're talking about. <clears throat> excuse me, that's pectoralis major, forming the anterior wall of the axilla there. Uh, medially then, we have the thoracic cage, so we've got the ribs, we've got the intercostal muscles, and we've got serratus anterior. They're forming the medial wall. Um, posteriorly, deep in there, um, oh, which we might have a look at on another model in a moment, well, we've got the scapula back here, right? So, there's the scapula. So the deep surface of the scapula is back in there, and that's covered by subscapularis. And then we also have um, teres major. So then if you feel the, the posterior wall of your axilla, that is teres major here in here. And then the lateral wall is the humerus. And you can imagine that when the arm is beside the body, everything in this space is really, really well protected. When you abduct the upper limb from the body, then the structures in here become a bit vulnerable. And look, the structures in the medial upper limb also become a bit vulnerable. Just to look at that again on an upper limb model, this is a right, right upper limb. So this is anterior, so here we have pectoralis minor and major here with pectoralis major forming the inferior edge there of the anterior border of the axilla. Um, medially we'd have the thoracic cage here, so it is anterior. Now here look, this is the, this is the, sca the scapula here, the flat bone in the back, right? the scapula and the scapula is covered by the subscapularis muscle on its deep surface so that's forming 
part of the posterior wall of the axilla. And then we have, um, we can see teres minor is under there, but this is teres major here. So teres major is the inferior most part of muscle here. So teres major is also forming part of the posterior wall of the axilla, and it's that inferior edge that you can, that you can grip. So teres major. And then medially, so what we've got in here is we've got the, uh, well in there we've got the, um, the humerus, the bone of the upper arm there. And we can see some of the structures now that are running within the axilla. So that is actually the coracoid process of the scapula. So we've got the short head of biceps and coracobrachialis. Those tendons are running through the axilla. You could consider those part of the walls. They're running to the coracoid process. And the bit of the humerus that is described in the textbooks as being the, the lateral wall of the axilla is the intertubercular um, groove because we've got muscle attachments and a bit of a groove there. So that is the axilla. All right, if we stick with the right arm, so the axilla down here, we're all agreed, there's lots of space around here, it all moves very nicely. But remember, the axilla is all about the upper limb and its attachment to the torso. So if we look up here, the apex of that pyramid, the apex of the axilla, called the cervico axillary canal, Look, it's bordered by some bony structures here. Our structures are going where my fingers are going. So between the clavicle, first rib, and the scapula posteriorly here, this is now much narrower. And all of these structures have got to go through here. And imagine that there are muscles attached to these bones, which there are. Um, so this is the narrow point, this is the crunch point, this is the bit where all those structures are probably at most risk. Can you imagine those structures getting compressed here? In fact, the apex of the axilla, when you abduct, so when you abduct your upper limb, the apex up here does get a little bit compressed. So that's the apex of the axilla there. And then we can connect to the structures of the neck and the thorax. So this is where blood vessels are coming from and going to. I mean, imagine, so, you know, like the veins from the upper limb, if they're going back through here, where are they going through and to next? What if this causes veins to become a bit wiggly? What are we worried about then? What about the arteries? Anyway, we'll come back to that later. So what is in the axilla? What's all the fuss about? <clears throat> Here's the axilla. Right, there's our space there, you're recognising now. We have the axillary artery and its branches. There is an axillary vein and its tributaries, the veins draining into that vein. And then we have the brachial plexus and the nerves of the brachial plexus that are going to the upper limb. Oh wow, those are really important structures. That's right, they are. So the axillary artery is a continuation of the subclavian artery. When the subclavian artery passes the first rib, we change its name to the axillary artery. So it gets called the axillary artery while it's running through the axilla, which means that when it leaves the axilla, which we just described as the inferior edge of the teres major muscle, right? When it leaves the axilla, we change its name again to become the brachial artery. The vein does the same thing. Um, also in here we find lymph nodes. There are a number of axillary lymph nodes. They are draining lymph from the upper limb, so also really, really important. And they are also draining lymph from the pectoral region, from the breast, part of the breast, from the anterior chest wall. Also really, really important, right? So there are a lot of uh, lymph nodes here as well. So we've got blood vessels, nerves and lymph nodes and muscles and, you know, everything a healthy person needs, right? Not all of the structures in the axilla leave through the base of the axilla, you know, through this bit. <clears throat> Some of them also find other ways out. Now we look at the posterior, so we're looking at the posterior right shoulder region here, and look, there's a gap there, right? That is the quadrangular space. The quadrangular space is a gap between the muscles, between teres major and teres minor, and this is part of triceps here. Um, there's a gap in there 
which links to the axilla. This is how the axillary nerve gets out. The axillary nerve is going to innervate the deltoid muscle. It's going to innervate the skin over the top of the deltoid muscle here. So this is the quadrangular space. Going back to this model, still on the right side, here's pectoralis major. There is a clavi pectoral space. Clavi pectoral. Hmm, I wonder where that could be. Well, here's the clavicle here, here's pectoralis major, and we can kind of see there's a gap between the deltoid muscle, pectoralis major, and the clavicle. Um, and in the upper limb, we have um, a cephalic vein that passes through here, and the pectoral nerves come out here to get to the pectoralis muscles, right? So the clavi pectoral triangle anteriorly. In the upper limb, we have a, we have a lot of veins, they're very varied down here, but you can see, or you can start to see one here. So we've got one vein that runs this away, which is the cephalic vein, it's a superficial vein, and then we have the basilic vein that's running around here. The basilic vein is going to find its way to drain into the, the um, brachial vein or the axillary vein, but it's the cephalic vein here that is going to go through that anterior space in the axilla to get into the axilla, to drain into the axillary vein. All right, so there are some tight spaces and those spaces are defined by muscles. So what would happen maybe if those muscles hypertrophy, if they get really big? So that's what the axilla is. Those are the muscles forming the four-walled pyramid of the axilla and those are the structures that are running through it and the narrow point is up here. Now, what might compress all of those important structures as they're running through the narrow point up here? Well, possibly the least likely is a cervical rib. Have you heard of a cervical rib? So the seventh cervical vertebra. So you see the first rib here um, is essentially associated with the first thoracic vertebra, but rarely there is, a, there is a cervical rib. It's often very, very short. It's associated with the C7 vertebra. It might be just on one side or on both sides, but can you imagine how a cervical rib here would add to the compression problems in this space. Rare, but it's a thing, so it's worth knowing about. Um, also, we talked about this is a muscular space, so, uh, and how abduction of the upper limb actually compresses the apex of the axilla pyramid up here. Um, so repetitive movements, um, repetitive movements where you know you're doing strength training or you're doing an active job raising your arms up raising your arms above your head these muscles are hypertrophying they're becoming bigger there's a limited space in here because of the position of the bones so as muscles grow they're taking up space so there's another chance of compressing these things in here right a fractured clavicle means that the ends of the bones can move around. So there's potentially less space there. So that's, you know, that's kind of what you're looking for is like repetitive overhead movements or raising your arm up or, I mean, it has been associated with posture, but I'm not sure how good the data is with that. But be aware of this narrow point here and all the structures that run through there. So if something's being compressed, let's add our, our anatomical knowledge together. What are we likely to see? If a nerve gets compressed, we'll get the typical nerve things going on. If a nerve is compressed, you get, you know, changes in sensation, paresthesia, maybe numbness, maybe pain, uh, maybe weakness of the muscles, you know, a loss of power, a loss of strength to the muscles that are innervated by that nerve. If an artery is compressed, then you're reducing the blood flow to the limb, so that limb might feel cold. You can compare the two limbs, right? It is likely to be paler than the other limb. This may well cause pain, right? Uh, what about if a vein is compressed? Or if a vein is compressed, then we're impeding venous return from the limb. So maybe swelling of the limb, pain again. But now here's the key thing. We're really worried about veins because if a vein has to make a little, little bit of a wiggly kink or something, or if it's getting a little bit squashed, we start to worry about Virchow's triad, don't we? 
um, you know, a change in flow, turbulence, change in turbulence, stasis, that sort of thing. What we're thinking about here is blood clots. A vein is susceptible to forming blood clots if the flow of blood through that vein or the endothelium is damaged, for example. And where are these veins going? Well, they're going back to the heart and then they're going from the heart to the brain and to the lungs. Two very vital, can you have very vital? I mean, vital just means necessary for life, right? Two vital structures. Um, so we worry about clots forming in the veins going back to the heart and then causing a pulmonary embolism or a stroke. So yeah, this is serious stuff, right? Serious anatomy. And all of those things get lumped together as thoracic outlet syndrome. So here's the thorax, you know, essentially this is the outlet to the upper limb. So if these structures are getting compressed here, they all come under that umbrella term of thoracic outlet syndrome. But of course they can be quite different things clinically and anatomically. But that is why the anatomy up here and the anatomy of the axilla is important. And I'm sure you'll find other uses for it as well, but there you go. The anatomy of the axilla. See you next week.